This is Michael Woodward, and this is episode 50 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, a podcast focused on telling the stories of dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers. Along the way, we'll give you some tips and ideas of how you can chase your big idea and dream and make it a reality. Today is a major milestone in the Jumble Think Podcast. It's episode number 50. Pretty cool stuff. Our guest today is Michael Tanzillo. It's going to be a lot of fun. More about Michael in a moment. On Monday, we have Mary Sue Connolly on she has worked for CNN and CBS. She's currently working on a project, a new documentary called The Petersburg Film about Petersburg, West Virginia. It covers and tells the story of the opioid epidemic and the heroin epidemic. Really important story. Can't wait to share that with you. Do you have a big idea and you don't know where to start? Every Friday, I release one tip Friday where I give you one actionable item that will move you closer to your big idea and dream. You can check it out on Facebook and on Instagram every Friday. So make sure to check it out. I hope it helps you on your journey to chase your big idea and dream and create the world you want to live in. Now let's jump into my interview with Michael Tanzillo. I am super excited about today's guest. His name is Michael Tanzillo. He is a senior artist at Blue Sky Animation. He's worked on projects like Ice Age, the Rio series, the Peanuts movie, and so many other really, really cool projects. In 2016, he launched a new company called Space Optimized. They specialize in interior design and space management for those tiny spaces, those tiny houses that you've seen so much about lately. This summer, his company is launching a new online design course that is killer awesome. This is a fun interview. I think you're really going to enjoy Michael's story. So let's jump into my interview with Michael Tanzillo. Mike, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Now, you have a really unique background. You've worked for Blue Sky Animation. You've worked uh, in, as an artist. You've worked in design. Tell us a little bit about your background and... What's gotten you to where you are today? Well, it's a little bit of a funny story. Um, so I started off in, I guess I'll start it as a undergraduate at Ohio State. I was involved in photography. I actually got a Bachelor of Fine Arts there in photography. Um, and I started working, just doing odd jobs after college. Uh, I worked a little bit for a wedding photographer. I worked in an art gallery. I mostly bartended to make uh, ends meet. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I actually had the uh, experience of watching Finding Nemo uh, at about that time. And I was watching it on DVD. And they had a behind-the-scenes footage of the artists at Pixar going scuba diving. And they were gathering reference of how the ocean looked for Finding Nemo. So they would go – I don't know if you if you pay attention in the film, but – at the beginning, when they're out in the ocean, um, the water is nice and crystal clear and blue, and it's very friendly and happy. And as they get closer to Sydney, the water gets thicker and greener and murkier as the tension starts to rise in the film. Yeah. And I thought it was incredible yeah, that there are these artists that whose sole job it is to kind of make this visual look for these films and, and to create these mood for these films. So um, I did a little more research. I discovered that I was grossly underqualified for such a position. So I, um, I began, uh, uh, studying on my own. And then I eventually went back to graduate school at the Savannah college of art and design and got a master's in visual effects and then got the job at blue sky. So I worked on a handful of ice age movies, um, Rio one and two, the peanuts movie and a film called Epic. I think that's all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really quite cool. When did you find that you had this passion or desire for design? Because it sounds like, like while you weren't really intending to go the course that you've gone, that even when you were younger, that photography, that arts, uh, was still something that was part of your core. So when did you find out, like, find that passion for design? You know, it's funny. I, I never was a very artistic kid growing up. I thought I was going to be a doctor through high school. 
And um, it actually, it was my senior year of high school. I took a photography class and that was the first time I started to play with the ideas of aesthetics and creativity and a little bit of the mechanical process of it too, which appealed to me, like the scientific process of, of developers and chemicals and all the different elements and scientific makeup of light and, and exposure that goes into photography. And I just really, really connected with that blend of artistic and, uh, scientific. And then, um, ever since then I've, I've gotten a little bit obsessed with composition and color and balance and all of those type of visual elements. Like I said, to this day, I'm still not the best, uh, drawer in the world or painter, but I can, um, but I've been studying color and texture and composition for, for years as a result of that. Well, it sounds like one of the core elements that you've really found an affinity for, a strength of yours, is the sheer ability just to absor- uh, ob- observe the situation, observe what you're seeing. You talk about composition, you talk about all of these different elements, and those are all observation points. That's that's a really good point. Yeah, I I definitely... Um, find myself uh, just quietly observing my surroundings all the time for different visual cues. And that's kind of one of my little joys in life is just, uh, you know, looking at the world and seeing the world around me. What's one observa- observation about your journey that looking back, uh, going through this process that you're really taking away and seeing how one thing led to another? One's, what's maybe one observation about that journey that somebody else could take away and saying, you know, I, I'm in the process of chasing my idea and I don't know the process. When you look back, what's something that you could give them and help them understand? I think the biggest one for me was I always was trying to plan my future. Um, I was always trying to envision where I was going to be five years from now. And because that's something that people will often talk about. And the one thing that I can, that I, if I could go back and tell myself something, it would be, stop it. <laughs> Don't do Because uh, ne- at any point in my life, if you would have told me that five years ago, I'd be sitting here doing what I'm doing today, I would have told you you were crazy. So just keep following what you're passionate about and keep just being curious and keep going after what you think, what kind of just tickles your uh, creativity and, and your inspiration. And it's amazing what kind of crazy places you'll end up. Now, as a senior artist for Blue Sky Animation, Mm -hmm. you have to work with other people. You have to collaborate. You have to interact. How does that uh, impact your creative process? Um, I find it incredibly inspirational. So the artists at Blue Sky are some of the best in the world. And I am constantly in awe of the artists there. And and just, um, it's, it's just constant inspiration. It's a constant hopefully back and forth that it's not one sided of just me kind of glomming off of them. But it's, it's great. When you create in a bubble, when you create in isolation, uh, I don't think you grow as much as you do when you're working collaboratively because you have the opportunity to see how other people are again, looking at the world around you and creating and you can build off of that. That's really good. Now in your process of what you do, uh, and, and this is a good segue into talking about this new venture that you're working on. Uh, what are some of your favorite aspects of design? What are the things that you're drawn to, whether it's creatively that you're doing or that that inspire you in that process of design? Well, for me, I, there's a lot of people that talk about how design's about stripping away the excesses. And that's something that's kind of been my my biggest, uh, something that I've always kind of focused on. And I, I remember I had a, I, it was a photography teacher in college and she, her name was Rebecca Modrak and I believe she's at the University of Michigan now. And she always taught me to have every element of whatever artwork you're creating, have all of the elements matter, have, you know, don't, nothing is arbitrary. The size of the piece, the material that you use, everything should have a meaning and everything should have a purpose. And I've kind of taken that into everything that I've done, including my design elements. Um, so I always think that every, whether, even if it's just like a visual artwork, everything should have meaning and everything should have a purpose and everything should, it, it should be there for a reason. And that's 
you know, you should have exactly what you need in order to get to the final product and nothing more. So that's, that's always been kind of my motivation. That's really a, a great concept because a lot of people have noise in what they're doing, whether it's design, whether it's even development and writing code and tech, or whether it's uh, storytelling, there's a lot of noise and, and, and getting something to its simplest form where there's purpose is a very complicated solution. Mm-hmm. How do you yeah. approach that to really strip back the things that don't matter so that when you're conveying something that the design of what you're doing has purpose across the spectrum of everything that's involved with it? It's a little tricky. I mean, it's it's just a matter of constantly evaluating what you're doing and um, because it's very easy to allow yourself to fall into a pattern, into a rhythm and to just keep uh, building and adding. And sometimes you have to, uh, stop and evaluate what you're doing and what you've done and then, you know, strip things back. So it's, it's just, it's a matter of constant evaluation. It's not a, uh, it's not something I, you can really wait until the end to do. It's, it's, it's a, it's a constant workflow. That's really cool. Now this is leading right into the whole minimalistic movement, the tiny home movement, the small houses. Tell us about space optimized. Right. So Space Optimized was something a it was it was started as a business earlier this year, but uh, it's something I've been working with for probably the last four or five years now. So I live in New York City and um, about five years ago, I, I had a major life change and I moved into a, a small studio apartment. Um, it's about 250 square feet and it costs five times more than my first apartment did. <laughs> wow. it, it's, 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 uh, New York is an incredible, uh, and, and I, and it's an incredible place and I couldn't imagine living anywhere else, but the cost of it is very expensive. So you find all these, you know, lots of people have to live in these small apartments, myself included. And when I moved in here, I didn't really have that much stuff. Now, let me backtrack a little bit before living here. I had a, a house in Connecticut, um, where I had, a living room and a dining room and multiple bedrooms. And, um, I was finding myself very frustrated because I, most of my weekends were spent cutting the grass, doing weeding or cleaning rooms that I never, ever went in. So when I moved into New York, I, you know, I obviously could only afford a very small place. (laughs) So I moved in here and I got rid of all of my stuff and I just sold it at yard sales and, and uh, gave it away to charity. And um, what I was left with was pretty much just like a, a bed, uh, some essential clothing, and that was about it. And and I with the and I and planned on purchasing all the things again uh, for this space. But what I found immediately was that having less stuff was so freeing. It freed my time. Uh, it freed my energy. It, it decluttered everything in my life. And it just generally made me happier. I was spending, you know, normally it would take me two hours to clean my house. In my apartment, it was taking me 15 minutes. I didn't have to deal with yard work. I didn't have to deal with anything. And I just found myself, you know, like my utility bills went down and I just found myself like feeling lighter and it was feeling more free and feeling happier in general. And so I decided, cause I, I always saw this studio apartment as a temporary fix and that I would try and get something larger again. But I, I've found that the, um, the smaller space was, was more fitting of my lifestyle, except for, I really, uh, wanted to start having people over at my place again. And the studio apartment with a bed in the middle of the room doesn't necessarily allow for that. Yeah, and you're talking like 200 square feet. You think of like dinner party. You think of that's that's smaller than some dining rooms and some right. houses. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was. I remember thinking when I when I moved in, I remember having to measure to see if I could fit both a bed and a love seat in here, <laughs> and it was close. Like, can I fit both of those things in and still be able to walk to the bathroom? And it was it was very tight. So, but yes, that was the, the major downside was I'm a very social person. I like to have people over and I did not like having people over to my apartment because I always felt like a nine year old boy with my friends coming over and I would kind of sit on my bed. Like it was, it was very awkward every time. So 
Uh, again, and this was probably three years ago, I started doing some research and I found um, uh, a guy named Graham Hill who has a website called Life Edited. And he had an exhibition here in New York where he was showing off his little micro apartment with all this transition furniture and everything. And I kind of fell in love with it. So I started doing all this research and I, you know, obviously I'm not the, I was looking for budget friendly solutions to this kind of thing. And so I started, you know, doing research into Murphy beds and these expandable tables and folding chairs and just ways to really maximize this space. Cause I wanted all the benefits that I had before of living with less and, 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 and things costing less while also maintaining my lifestyle of, um, making my home a place where I could entertain. So I spent a couple years researching that and I kind of, uh, and then and it was like two years of research and then six months of furious redecorating and remodeling in my place. And, um, and, and after that, yeah, I was able to, uh, find some, uh, solutions and I was able to have that dinner party. So, okay. 200 square foot space. Yes. How many people can you have a dinner party and what happens to that furniture to accommodate it? The bed <laughs> has to disappear. Yes. The table has to appear. Chairs have to appear. You still have to, uh, you know, get everything else that's in the space accounted for. How do you navigate that? So the the first obstacle is obviously the bed, and the solution is, and you can find examples of these at resource furniture or expand furniture. I actually found um, a guy here in New York who uh, at a place called Murphy Bed Express that will do. Um, the uh, Murphy bed for less. And for those of you that, and, and, and actually saying the words Murphy bed make most people cringe because they think of like a very uncomfortable sleep experience. So basically it's a, um, it's a Murphy bed couch, uh, combination. And what I mean by that is that when it, the bed is up, it's really hard to explain on a podcast, <laughs> but, um, when the bed is up, it becomes like the area behind your couch and the couch is then in front of it. And then when you go to put the bed down, all you have to do is take the back cushions off the couch and the bed folds down over top of the couch. And if you go, I'll, uh, there's photos on my website and such, and I will, uh, on spaceoptimize.com, I will, uh, gladly share them with you as well. So you can put them on your website so that <laughs> the listeners can see this. So, so the first step is obviously, Get the, get the bed up and out of the way and allow the area to be the couch. Now, the couch also doubles as seating for the dining room table. Now, the 200 square feet, again, is very, very small. So my dining room table needs to be something that is a, a large table to feed uh, about six to eight people. And um, But it can't be out all the time because a table that's large enough to fit six to eight people would be incredibly it would it would overpower my space so yeah. um there is a table that is being that i found at expand furniture and it's called i believe it's the little giant or the junior giant i think is what it is and what it does is it's a table that compresses down to about 18 inches wide but it cut comes with four different leaves and when you pull it out like it goes from 18 inches and can expand all the way to about i would say eight feet i don't wow. have the dimension in front of me and it just expands like crazy and you could four, put four full leaves in it to to make it incredibly large so i have uh, a little sliver of my closet that stores the leaves and in so for 95 percent of the time my dining room table is about an about an 18 inch wide little end table that sits in this little nook in my apartment and functions almost as my desk. But when I need it, I can expand it out and it can seat eight people comfortably. That's crazy. So you're able in a small space to live, sleep, and have guests over for yeah. that dinner party, and it and it feels cohesive between the different. It's basically a transformer room if you will yeah, it goes yeah. it goes from one form to another form to another form so it'd be like in the average home it would be going oh i'm walking from the dining room now into the living room now i'm walking from the living room into the bedroom but it's one space that transforms all those needs exactly exactly because at no point 
do you need to be in your living room and the bedroom at the same time? There's no time when I would need the bed and couch at the same time. I'm either lying in bed or I'm sitting on the couch. I can't do both. So might as well have them occupy one space. So tell us a little bit about what space optimized. Now that we know the 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 backstory of how you got to kind of this revelation of, you know, we, I there are benefits to having a big space, but for most people it becomes a a drag a weight on them that they have to manage and pay for and work on to this right. to this minimalistic house. We know that backstory now. How has that launched you into this new thing that you're doing with Space Optimized? And what is Space Optimized? So what Space Optimized is, so after that experience, I found that I had this wealth of information in my head and a passion to share what I learned and what I found to make my life better with others. So I started working with some friends and I was just advising them a little bit. And after doing that, I got inspired to start my own business with it. So I, you know, went out and I launched spaceoptimized.com and I started designing the website and yeah, so I went out and I launched spaceoptimized.com and what the goal of it is, is I, again, I just want to share my experience with others. So at first and, and currently, uh, I'm working with clients to help them design their space to achieve the same practical goals that I was able to with my apartment. And it's not always dinner parties in a studio apartment. It's all about people deciding what they want their home to be. Lots of times it's home offices. Lots of times it's finding play space for their kids. And it's using like these essential ideas of making transformable furniture and our one room serve multiple purposes. And it's about accommodating people's lives in the space that they have. And I know that a lot of the minimalism is is focused on this idea of of people with large homes trying to downsize. But like I said, in New York, things are so expensive here that you don't really have a choice but to be downsized. So it's maximizing the space that you're able to work with. And that's and that's really at the core of what I'm trying to do at Space Optimized. And you have some great articles on the website that walk people through different strategies and thoughts behind that. And you tell some great stories through that. You also have a really killer Instagram feed that shows spaces and what you can do in a small space. Um, tell us yeah. a little bit about how people can start discovering what it means to live. Um, you know, I've, I've heard some someone say in a documentary about minimalism uh, that minimalism isn't about having nothing. It's about having the least amount for you to be happy, for you to be like, I'm going to strip away. Again, it's that whole, whole uh, stripping things that don't matter back to what's left that does matter. So for some people that might be going from a McMansion to you know, a, a condo for other people. It might be going from a big space to a not so big space, you know? (laughs) So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for me, I, it it almost makes me cringe. I I actually wrote an article about this on the website where I say, I, I don't like to call myself a minimalist because that immediately implies that I don't like stuff. I love stuff. Like I, I, there are things in my life, there are objects that I have like my camera or I've got some, like my transformable bed. I love all this stuff. And so for me, it's not about having, it's not a game to have as little as you can. There are, it's a, it's a great headline to be like, I traveled around the world with these 32 things. Like it's a very appealing article. But to me, it's, it's about identifying the things in your life or identifying the activities in your life that you want to achieve and then having the stuff to make that happen. So like I said, if I am a photographer, I still love that. So therefore I'm going to have a camera that allows me to follow this passion. I, I don't play the piano, so I'm not going to have a piano in my home, taking up a lot of square footage that I'll never use. It was like one of the things at my home, in uh, Connecticut that drove me crazy was I had this nice China in like a China cabinet thing. And it would, and I remember I, I would all, and, and the cabinet would always get very dusty. Yeah. And so I like every week I was just dusting this thing, looking at these plates that I never, ever used because I don't know anybody fancy enough <laughs> that would want to use China. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's what it was about to me. It's about identifying 
it's it's all about living the life that you want to live and having the objects to accommodate that. What are some questions people could be asking themselves in this process of hearing, you know, you go from this house in Connecticut to uh, the studio space in New York City. And and for a lot of people there, they may be going, well, I don't relate to that story. I'm not moving to New York City. I have a family. I have kids. But what are some of the questions they could be asking themselves to really see if what they have and what they're living like is really adding to their life or is beneficial to the lifestyle that they want to live? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the biggest thing is to be honest with yourself. This was, this was the hardest one for me, right? This was the hardest thing that I had to learn. And it was to be honest with yourself of who you are and what it is that you actually want to do in your life. Now, I, I'm i trying to think of an example. Oh, like I've always wanted to learn how to snowboard. Okay. I, I've never done it. I'm 36 years old and I've never once been snowboarding. So I can't possibly want to do it that much. If I owned a snowboard, it would be a terrible investment to have in my life because it's not realistic. Although in your head, you think that's the type of person that you want to be, that you want to be a snowboarder, that it's not necessarily fitting with what the reality of your life is. On the other hand, if you like watching television, like I said, I worked in movies for years and you that is a big part of your life, then you go ahead and you have a television in your home. It's being realistic with yourself and identifying the activities and the things that you genuinely love doing and uh, and then going from there. Yeah. I, you know, I've heard a couple people talk about it and they've said stuff like, you know, every time I buy something new, I go through and I take kind of stock of what I have. And sometimes I go and I say, well, that piece of furniture, that piece of that, that snowboard sitting on the corner or that, whatever it is, I'm never going to touch that again, or I'm not going to use it, or I'm never going to use it. It's time to get rid of that. And so they use that moment of, of something new to reflect on what they already have to see if it's time to clean something out. So one story I heard that really resonated with me was by a guy named Joshua Becker, and he has a website called Becoming Minimalist. And this is a story that I read a long time ago, and I think it's something that uh, will help kind of communicate this. So he was at home. It was a Saturday morning, and he wanted to clean out his garage. He has a couple kids, and his son was asking him to play in the backyard, and they just wanted to play catch and play baseball. Uh, He said, sure thing. He just wanted to clean out the garage first. So he goes out there. He takes all this stuff that it's in boxes. He pulls it all out. He grabs the hose. uh, He starts to hose everything down. And in the meantime, he looks out and he sees his son just kind of quietly playing in the backyard by himself. And occasionally throughout this process, his son keeps coming over to ask, is he done? Is he done? Is he done? And after moving all these boxes, cleaning out all the space and putting all the boxes back, he realized he just wasted four hours. Wow. A Saturday morning that he could have been playing with his son because he had to move things that he never uses, hose that like, <laughs> clean it, and then put them back. And 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 if he just got rid of all that stuff, he would never have to do that chore. And he could have just played with his son that whole morning. So, and it's one of those things that you you don't think because if you have uh, because like I had I you know I had, if you have a basement, if you have a garage, if you have additional storage space, just because the stuff fits doesn't mean it's not taxing on your life because you do have to organize it. You do have to dust it. You do have to go through it occasionally. And it does take away from the, you doing the things in the life that you really want to do. Well, it sounds like it's all about is what I have in my life and is what I want purposeful. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about leaving a purpose filled life. That's really, really cool. Now tell us about this really cool resource that you're launching this summer. Yeah. So I am excited about this because like I said, I've had the opportunity to work with some clients one-on-one, but the next step for space optimize is that I'm going to be launching some courses because it's not always, I I, I'm trying to reach as many people as I can. And it's not always practical for me to work with people one-on-one either it's uh, cost prohibitive or it's time prohibitive or, you know, it's space prohibitive because although I've, I'm happy to Skype with people. I'm happy to work with people remotely. It is very beneficial for me to physically be in the space. So what I'm doing is I'm launching a combination of two different things. The first is going to be a series of free workshops that you can um, 
sign up for on my website. And it's going to be uh, some simple solutions. Like right now I'm working on a video that's going to show you how to create a mood board for your apartment so you can develop a visual aesthetic for your space that you can refer back to. Because like I said, I am at my core, I'm an artist and I'm a designer. So Although I have this minimalist, although I have this minimalist style and minimalist focus, I also want your home to be beautiful as well. So, yeah. um, so I am launching a series of courses that and, and workshops that will help you get the uh, achieve the minimalism while uh, also having a well designed, beautiful home as well. Well, and I think a lot of people think of minimalism, minimalism. They go, I need a chair, I need a desk, I need a couch, I need a bed. That's it. Close, yeah. the, close the door. Nothing else comes in. But that's not the truth of it. You can have a small space or a large space designed minimalistically or design well for that space and still have things and still have beauty in your space. And I don't know where this thing came from that all minimalist apartments have to just be white walls and gray (laughs) furniture and like very cold. Uh, I love incorporating uh, house plants into my designs. I love incorporating personal uh, photographs and and things that are unique. And one of the biggest things that I say is that um, I always I always think that you should have something whimsical in your, uh, I always try to incorporate some of the whimsical things in your design. One of the objects that I love, and actually this serves no functional, (laughs) it doesn't always serve a functional purpose. But one of the things I love is I found this like 1920s pair of safety glasses that you would use in a workshop. And I just have those, they're they're like on a shelf by them, by themselves in my apartment. And I just, they, they just make me so happy to look at them every time. And, um, I would be lying if I said on evenings when I'm home by myself, I don't put them on and think they're (laughs) hilarious. But so I always think, I always say this like that, just because I'm saying that you should have less stuff uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't have things that, that make you smile every day. Well, and I think we need more things around us that make us smile. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're launching this new program, um, this free uh, online curriculum, this course. Yeah. How can people find that and when is it coming to market? So the free courses – so. <laughs> One of the things that's nice about me living this uh, minimalist life is that I've been able to do a lot more traveling, which is a big passion of mine. So I am going for a uh, two-week stint. I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm taking my nephew to Japan over the next two weeks, and then once I get back, I will uh, be launching the first of the free workshops, which is the. Um, the creating the mood board and designing a blueprint for the aesthetics of your design. And that should be ready within, I would say by the end of July. And then after that, I'm going to be releasing, uh, some free, uh, free content every few weeks from there. So it'll just kind of be a slow stream of free stuff. And then by the end of the year, I'm hoping to launch my first full, uh, paid class, which would be designing your own, uh, space optimized home by the end of the year. That's really cool. Now, there are, let's just be honest, impatient people out there. Of course. And they can go ahead and swing on over to your website and keep up to date by signing up for your newsletter and for information about the course, right? Absolutely. And we already have a ton of articles uh, written on the website. I have a, uh, an extremely great writer named Tina Lee who writes the majority of the articles and the content for the website. And uh, it's all about um, – we already have – I think we're up to 70 or seventy articles-ish about uh, space-saving furniture, cool you know, space-saving designs, and just l- living a happy life with less. So you can already go on there and start, and, and start gobbling up our, um, our content there. And by the time you're done with that, I will have some uh, free workshops ready for you. That's so good. And you're also on Instagram, as I mentioned before. What's the best yes. way for them to connect on Instagram? So you can just, uh, my Instagram account is space optimized. Um, you can just follow me there. I, I am on it just because again, as such a visual person, I love, uh, Instagram as a source for just, uh, checking out. There are a lot of great designers on there and I, I love to create, to post my own content, to share the work of others and just kind of, um, uh, so yeah, you can reach out to me through Instagram or you can just, uh, email direct me directly at Mike at space com. You also do offer some consulting one-on-one and helping people with their spaces, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah, you can. I, I, I certainly offer services um, for those that are looking at um, uh, le- leading a more minimal life and redoing their spaces to help work with the lives that they're currently living. Yeah, I absolutely. So whether you're in New York or outside of New York, I will be more than happy to work with, uh, work with you to help you achieve your dream home. You know, you mentioned mood boards and and I wanted to step back for a moment and just talk about those. Uh, I work in the development sphere of web development design. Uh, we see it a lot in web design. We see it a lot in fashion world. But a lot of people might be going, a mood board, like, is that like a mood ring? What is a mood board? <laughs> Do you want to hit on that real quick? Yeah, what exactly. That is? Sorry, I, I've, I've, I'm in this world a little bit too much. No, sometimes. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, 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 the reason why I'm making this workshop first is because the number one mistake that I see that people make when designing their own apartments is, and believe me, I've done this too, is you design do you design it without a game plan you design it without a blueprint of how you want your room or your home to look and to feel and to behave so what i'm teaching and what a mood board is is you sit back first you do some research you develop an aesthetic for a room and it could be a color palette i usually like to find a single image that kind of incorporates everything that you want your room to be. It's just like a starting off point. And then you identify the colors in that image. You identify the, um, the elements of it that help give it the mood that you want. I remember for, for my apartment, I found a single image of just a frog on a pond laying on a lily pad on his back, just looking as peaceful as can be. And, um, and that was the basis of the design for my apartment. So there was a lot of, it was like a foggy morning. So I incorporated a lot of grays into my spaces. Um, he was on this lily pad. So I've, I've incorporated a lot of the greens in, in some house plants and air plants around my apartment. So what I encourage people to do is to develop that mood board or that image as a base point uh, for them designing their own spaces. Because what it does is it actually stops you from making unnecessary purchases. Yeah. And because if you say to yourself, okay, well, I've got this color palette of, you know, I, I want these very wit- rich uh, blue greens and an accent of some yellow and some, you know, maybe like, the, but the base color is a gray or whatever, whatever the case may be. And you're out and it, and I can't tell you how many times uh, like I said, I go out, I'm um, at a flea market, I'm at a store and I see something that I like and I stop myself from getting it because I say, no, 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 that doesn't fit the mood board. It doesn't fit the design palette. And therefore, it because I, I, I know I would get it out there and I'd bring it <laughs> home and I go, oh man, this doesn't fit anywhere. So it allows you to um, focus what you're uh, bringing into your home uh, and and allows you your, your room. And, and actually the end product is great because it's a cohesive design with a common theme and a common, common element and it all kind of comes together. So I think it's I think it's extremely important for anyone designing a home. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And, and when you say picture, you're not talking, hey, go out there, find your perfect space and use that picture as the inspiration. What you're saying no. is, is, you know, find a picture that maybe inspires you or that you're visually drawn to. It could be... I think think of a picture of kids at a farmer's market jumping in a, uh, a puddle uh, as one of my favorite pictures. I think of uh, pictures of New York City and street life and, and that kind of thing. And some of those pictures are some of my favorite pictures. So those yeah. are the kind of pictures you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the things that I've worked with in the past, I've, I've somebody, you know, had this Norman Rockwell painting or, uh, you know, so it'll be an, like, I've even, like, there have been abstract paintings. There have been uh, photographs from, uh, yeah, different times or just like, you know, lots of times it'll be like a, uh, something that represents, uh, you know, the Victorian era and it's like, okay, cool. Like I, it's just anything. Or I remember somebody once started it with the idea of a 1920s French carnival. And I was like, okay, great. Like we, 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 we found an image of this 1920s French carnival and we went from there and it was like, all right, cool. That's, that's a, that's a good starting off point. So it's just, yeah, it's just something to give you a feeling of a time and a space and a place and a, and then you can, you can make your home. Uh, similar to that. That's really, really cool. And we'll have links to your website, your blog, your Instagram, so that if you're listening to this episode, you can go real easily right from the episode notes over to check out what Michael's doing in his space. Before we jump into our rapid fire questions, 
I don't always get to ask this question, but when I do, it makes me very happy. Uh, <laughs> and you are the perfect person to ask. I, uh, New York City is one of my favorite places in the world. And I try to get up there as much as possible. I have an office there. Uh, I would probably live in Soho if it was up to me. Uh, but, you know, who can afford Soho? And um, what's, what are some places in New York if somebody's coming in that they really should check out? Whether it's a restaurant, whether it's uh, a theater, whatever that is, what's one place that you go, hey, if you're in New York City, go check it out? Oh man, that is a tough question. I listen. I like I said, I've lived in um, in on the Upper West Side for uh, four and a half, going on five years now, and the thing that I always tell people is that New York is such a. Um, it's it's one of those things because people will come to New York and they'll go to Times Square and they think I can't live here because of all this hustle and bustle, yeah. but for me. New York is a very simple life. I love walking to the grocery store. I love walking to the market. There's a ton of, there's always great restaurants anywhere. And my favorite part about New York is Central Park. I am an avid, I, I enjoy running very much. And I, I almost every morning and um, in most days of the week, I find the time to go for a run in Central Park. And one of the things about it that is incredible to me is just how different it is every single day. There's, uh, if you if you just go around the park in a loop, you'll see anything from people doing Tai Chi to people painting to people doing like a uh, workout programs to there's just an incredible an assortment. Or you'll find people playing Quidditch, which is the Harry Potter game. Yeah, yeah. Doing uh, live action role playing. You'll find just anything and everything. And it's every time of year. Um, I remember in the middle of winter. I, I went and I went for a run and there was just a bunch of people out. It was a, uh, um, a snowman competition and it was just a bunch of these incredible snowmen. And so I would say if, if I could pick one place to tell people to go to in New York, it would be to take a couple hours and just allow yourself to walk through central park a little bit. And, um, which is which is crazy to go to the uh, largest city in the country and then spend the day at the park. But it's just an absolute uh, marvel that there's this sanctuary in the middle of this house, uh, in the middle of this incredible city, and um, and just allow yourself to check out some of the things that are going on here. And there's a lot of hidden treasures in uh, in Central Park. Uh, yeah, you go through there and you just kind of stumble upon things and you go, oh. Didn't know there's, that was there. There's a castle yeah. in Central Park. Who knew? You know, <laughs> your castle. There's the sh the free Shakespeare in the park. There's the Jackie Onassis Reservoir, which if you go up to the north side of it, you'll see incredible views of the entire skyline. I'm, I do that almost every day. And uh, there's the Ramblings, which is uh, right by the uh, by the pond on towards the south end of the park. There's a and in the pond you can take out rowboats. There's just incredible iconic. Uh, images and, and, and in iconic places that, like I said, there's, there's another pond on the East end closer to like 70th street where there's just always kids with, um, mechanical remote controlled sailboats and they're just sailing oh. around these ponds all day long. And then there's the central park zoo mixed in there and there's this carnival area. And it's just, it's just a really magical, uh, place in the middle of a, of an urban jungle. Now you talked about running central park. I've got to ask, as a person that has run Central Park and done some races there, uh, do you go up the west side and down Harlem Hill, or do you go up the east side and up Harlem Hill? Well, I, um, I'm part of a running group that meets in Central Park uh, a couple days a week in the morning. And so we meet on the east side of the reservoir. So we actually uh, start out east, we run north, and so we run up Harlem Hill uh, very regularly. So... Uh, yes. So I am. And you know what, Harlem, <laughs> if you, you can either go up Harlem Hill, or you can go down it and there's a, a, a vicious hill on the other side. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Any way you cut it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough run. But like I said, I, it's, um, it's a, it's, it's incredible. Oh, and then yes. And if you don't want to run Harlem Hill, if you get down to the bottom at the very Northeast corner of the park, I just found a beautiful garden. Like I just found, like I discovered it. Like, no, they're there. I just was too dumb to see them. <laughs> There's a beautiful garden on the very northeast corner of uh, Central Park that is absolutely incredible. There's there's also a little pond out there as well. So if you 
decide if you're up in that area and you decide to go down the hill, but you don't want to go back up, you can find a beautiful garden over there. That's really cool. My my fastest 5K distance was in a half marathon in New York City through uh, through Central Park. So it's 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 an awesome place to run for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let's try, uh, let's dive into some rapid fire questions. These are the questions that I asked that some of them um, are big picture questions. Some of them are just inspiration questions that help our listeners have an idea of how they can chase their big idea and dream. So the first Great. question is, what are some tips that you would give someone with a big idea or dream and they simply don't know where to start? The first piece of advice I give anyone who's going after a big idea is you have to break it down into smaller pieces because the large idea will feel overwhelming and it'll feel terrifying and you won't even know where to get started. So I always tell people to, this is my biggest one. And I do this every, I'm trying to do this every day (laughs) where in, in the morning, the right when I get to, right when I start my work day, I just write down, uh, three to five things that I want to accomplish that day. And what I do is I find the easiest one. Sometimes it's even just as simple as uh, get into contact with so-and-so or reply to this email just to get the ball rolling a little bit. And I take care of the, I I do the low hanging fruit first and then I go to the hardest task and I, and I take care of those, the very first thing out of the course of the day. So um, I get through the five most essential parts of my day and then everything else after that, I consider icing on the cake. So it's about setting small goals for yourself and in, in order to help you achieve the larger ones. So it, because you can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You need to, you know, start small and, and gain, allow yourself to gain a little momentum. That's really, really good. Now you live in New York city, which is, let's be honest, just the center of the world. Uh, <laughs> and you travel a lot. Mm-hmm. What's one change in the world you'd like to see? Wow. That is a big question. Um, one change I would like to see in the world, and um, because of the um, uh, because I've been fortunate to travel a little bit more, is that I think I had somebody say this to me one time. My friend uh, Jen said this to me. She said that she wishes there could be a government program that would allow. Uh, all Americans to travel somewhere in the world outside of the United States. Like it was like mandatory that at some point uh, for us to travel outside of the United States. And I think that that would be the, I mean, obviously I would solve world hunger and <laughs> war before any of this, but to, to try and say something different, uh, I would say I, I would like to see the opportunity for people to visit other cultures and, uh, and to go other places that are a little bit outside of your comfort zone, because it does a couple things. It allows you to gain a better understanding of what other people are going through. But I've actually never felt prouder to be an American than when I go somewhere else. Like it makes me, it solidifies my identity as an American because, you know, lots of times here we'll say things like, oh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, quarter Italian or half German or whatever. And then like, I'll say that I have an Italian last name. And then, but then when I go to Italy and I'm there for like 30 seconds, I was like, Oh no, no, I'm totally an American. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even speak this language. So, um, so I think, I think it does, uh, it, it allows you to, um, you know, it, it expands your, your vision of the world and it also connects you more to your home and more to your roots. That's really good. You're, you're in your mid thirties. Yes. Uh, you're starting to think probably about, you know, what you're, you're in a, a season of transition. Uh, you are looking to the future. What do you want your legacy to be? Wow, man, these are the biggest questions ever. <laughs> uh, oh man. Um, the biggest one for me, I would say is I, I've always been for the last 20 years, almost, I've been someone who's, I've been making images uh, or art or design in one way or another. And I would say if I could make the world a little more beautiful, that would be, that would be the legacy I'd like to leave behind. Obviously I want to be generous to my friends and to my family. I would like to be someone who was always seen as being very positive, but in terms of a global view, I think I would just like to leave the world a little more beautiful than I found it. 
when you work, look at the world of design, who's a designer that you just really are inspired by? Well, in terms of the, the minimalist stuff, the person that got me involved with this was uh, uh, Graham Hill, who does, like I, I mentioned him earlier, he does the Life Edited. And he was a designer who introduced me to all of this. If you haven't had the opportunity, you guys should check out his, I think it's like a five to six minute TED Talk, and it completely changed my life. What are you currently reading or watching? I am currently, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm currently watching the latest season of Fargo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I absolutely love. I've been I've been just engulfing the the first three seasons of the show, and I just I find them absolutely mesmerizing in terms of their story, but also like visually. I think they're just uh, they're absolutely fantastic. And in terms of reading, I am reading a Malcolm Gladwell book right now, and just because it's a little bit of an escapism for me, I find his his writing to be um, charming and entertaining and um, and just something that I can connect with. I find, I, yeah, I find his viewpoint very enlightening. Which, uh, which book is it? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah. So the book I'm reading right now is What the Dog Saw. It's just a series of uh, articles that he's written over the past. And it's just a bunch of short stories that I find. And they're all incredibly interesting and incredibly entertaining. Now, I end every episode with this final question. What's okay. one dream that you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Well, I'll give you a professional one and personal one. I'm a 36 year old guy, so I'd still love to be a dad. I'll give you that one. Okay. Let me. I'll. I'll, I'll give a professional goal. I would love to help a uh, hundred people design and create their ideal homes, whatever it may be. And and that's 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 where my goal is right now. I'd like to help a hundred people. Michael, it's been so much fun having you on. What you're doing is really fascinating, and I think. Uh, You're doing really cool stuff. So thanks for taking time out and sharing your story with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Once again, I want to thank today's guest, Michael Tanzillo, for sharing his story and more about what he's creating through his company, Space Optimize. On Monday's episode, we have another incredible guest and a very important story to tell you. Her name is Mary Sue Connolly. She has worked for CNN and CBS. She is currently working on a documentary called the Petersburg film about Petersburg, West Virginia, and the opioid and heroin epidemic that is hitting it. It's an important story because I think every community is struggling with these addictions, and it's an important story for you to hear. So check it out this Monday. Make sure you check out our Facebook and Instagram account tomorrow for One Tip Friday, where we share one tip that gives you an actionable step that you can take to make your dream or your big idea a reality. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start, and these little tips give you simple ways that you can make your dream a reality. If you go over to jumblethink.com, you can find the links both to our Facebook and Instagram account. Make sure you follow us or like us. That way you'll know every week the new episodes and also those One Tip Fridays as they come out. I want to thank you, the listener, for taking time out to listen to these stories of incredible people and creating their dreams and big ideas. It's not as hard as you think. I want to encourage you to go out and take the first step on your journey to create your big idea and create the world you want to live in. Thanks again for tuning in and check out our next episode with Mary Sue Connell. En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps. Vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.